Hello and welcome to History with Jackson. This video is sponsored by The Historian's Magazine. Edition 4 has just been released and there's loads of fantastic historical articles in here. There's stuff on bonfire nights, there's stuff on the Stalinist state, estate which, which has been written by me. Now I really encourage you guys to go and check this magazine out, it's incredibly informative and they have loads of great historical facts in the magazine and on their social medias and the links to all of those will be in the description below. So go and check out The Historian's Magazine. So today in the English and British Monarchs series, we are going to look at Edward I's son and heir, Edward II. As usual, we're going to look at who he was, what his early life was like, what his reign was like, and then bring that all together to analyse his reign to see if he was a good king or not. Now, without further ado, let's learn about Edward II. Edward II was born on the 25th of April, 1284, at Carnarvon Castle in Wales to Edward I and Eleanor of Castile. It is thought that Edward I wanted Edward to be born in Wales, and particularly Carnarvon, as it was culturally important to the Welsh. Edward was considered an educated man, and he grew to be a tall, muscular, good-looking man although he was considered unusual or weird by some members of nobility at that time, as he partook in unusual hobbies for the period, such as hedging and ditching, and also rowing. It's also said that he preferred to hang around with men of the lower rank of society, such as labourers. So what was Edward's early life like? Now, Edward spent a large amount of his early life and his education underneath the Dominican friars, so he did have a very religious upbringing. He was also, like his father before him, used in his father's own political and diplomatic games. And in 1290, for the Treaty of Bergen, he was betrothed to Margaret of Norway. Edward I betrothed his son Edward to Margaret of Norway in an effort to try and bring together the Scottish, Norwegian and English thrones underneath one leader. Unfortunately, Margaret of Norway passed away at a very young age and this marriage never materialised. Now, Edward spent very little time with his mother, Eleanor of Castile, as in this period she was away with his father in Gascony. Uh, but very shortly after Margaret's death, Eleanor passed away as well. After Eleanor of Castile passed away, Edward inherited his mother's lands and became Count of Poitou. For his father, this made Edward a more eligible marriage bachelor or proposition for many other nobles in Europe. And Edward I attempted to arrange many other marriages for Edward, uh, but none of these really materialised. However, Edward's father later succeeded in creating a marriage for him when there was an alliance created with the French which allowed the French princess Isabella of France to be betrothed to his son, Edward. During this period, Edward's father trusted him and made him Prince of Wales, Earl of Chester and Regent whilst he was on campaign in Scotland. Edward also helped command his father's armies in other battles with Scotland as well. But in 1305, Edward and his father fell out over money issues. But when they later reconciled, Edward was given command of armies in battles with Scotland and was made Duke of Aquitaine. From this point onwards, Edward and his father began to clash even more with Edward's advisor and close friend Piers Graveson being the centre of some of these clashes. And Edward I exiled Piers to stop these clashes. Now there has been some speculation over Edward's relationship with Piers Graveson, with some believing that it was a loving homosexual relationship, and more recent scholarship believing that this was either 
a really close working relationship or a form of adoptive brotherhood. Now, as we looked at last week, in 1307, Edward I passed away on his way to go and fight the Scottish in battle again. His son, Edward, was declared king and he immediately recalled Piers Graveson from his exile, made him the Earl of Cornwall, one of the most prestigious titles in the country, and put him in charge of government as Edward went to France to finally marry Isabella of France. Edward's move to put Graveson in charge put out many nobles' noses, especially his stepmothers, who believed that the Earl of Cornwall title had been reserved by Edward I for one of her sons. And the following year, in 1308, Edward returned with Isabella of France, ready to be coronated. At his coronation, Edward II managed to offend even more nobles, as Graveson was given a massively overrated role in the coronation ceremony than compared to the role that his station and his title would usually be allowed. And by late 1308, the nobles had had enough, and they called on Edward to remove Graveson's title and his influence from government. And Edward II had no more leg to stand on for this, and removed Graveson's title and exiled him from the country making him Lieutenant of Ireland. In 1310, Graveson had returned and Parliament had had enough of the King's behaviour and they set up a committee called the Ordinances. And the Ordinances immediately set about reforming the King's household and they put restrictions on the King. They made it so that the King had to pay back his debts and that the money flowed straight to the treasurer as opposed to through the king. They also controlled royal appointments and they immediately exiled Graveson as they disliked the influence that he had on the king. The ordinances were mostly successful with their goals but they had to exile Graveson twice and he returned twice and by 1312 Leading nobles such as the Earl of Warwick and the Earl of Lancaster had had enough and they arrested Graveson and they executed him. The death of Graveson drove a wedge between King Edward and the leader of the ordinances, the Earl of Lancaster. However, in 1313 the king had began to gain support when he and Isabella of France had a son named Edward as well. This son would continue the Plantagenet dynasty and, st and would strengthen Edward's control on the country. Now, at this point, Edward decided to retaliate to the Scottish raids into the north of the country and march north to fight the Scots. However, Edward's campaign was not like his father's and he was embarrassingly defeated by Robert the Bruce at Bannockburn. Edward returned to England with no money and less supporters than he had before. With Edward's power weakened, the ordinances decided to wrestle this power and attempt to govern England themselves. However, they were equally as ineffective as the Earl of Lancaster was reported to masquerade around and hold courts in the north of England instead of actually governing. In this void emerged a new Edwardian favourite, which was Hugh the Dispenser and the Dispenser family. As tensions rose, England fell into another civil war, as the marcher lords decided to attack the Dispensers. This clearly shows the nobility's anger towards Edward's favourites, and they forced Edward to exile the Dispensers. And even Isabella of France begged Edward to exile them as well. And they were exiled by Edward for a matter of weeks. And in this civil war, Edward demonstrated his skill as a military commander and tactician. 
Edward was able to quickly disband the Marcher Lord's efforts and he managed to corner the Earl of Lancaster with his armies. Information then emerged and came to the King that the Earl of Lancaster had negotiated with the Scots to gain support for his efforts against Edward. Edward then claimed that this was treason and had the Earl of Lancaster arrested and executed, firmly ending this civil war. Edward reacted to this rebellion with Plantagenet rage, and probably a typical Plantagenet reaction. And he called a parliament in May 1322. At this parliament, he brought back the dispensers and he dismissed and destroyed the Earl of Lancaster's reforms. He also has been called a tyrant in this period as he executed all of the opposition members that he could and imprisoned their families in many of his castles and he filled the Tower of London. At this point, Edward was in dispute with the new French king, Charles IV, who distrusted English presence in France. And one noble, Roger Mortimer, escaped the Tower of London and fled to France to be under the protection of Charles IV. This angered Edward and in response, he confiscated property from French people in England, including Isabella of France, his own wife and queen. Edward attempted to negotiate peace with Charles IV and he sent two envoys to France to attempt this. And the second envoy, an attempt for peace, he sent his own wife, Isabella of France. As Charles IV was her own brother, he thought this would be the best way to gain peace. From here, a peace was made and it was agreed between Edward and Charles that Edward's own son, the Prince Edward would be sent to France to pay homage for the French lands and this would make him Duke of Poitou and Aquitaine. After this homage had been paid, Isabella and Edward decided to stay in France. Isabella had always felt that she had been unfairly treated by her husband. She felt that he preferred his favourites over her and that she was treated like a maid. So she decided to stay under the protection of her brother, Charles IV, with her son. Here, she met Roger Mortimer and allied with him. They also became lovers. And in September 1326, Isabella, Edward and Roger Mortimer arrived with some troops ready to invade England from Suffolk and London revolted in support. In reaction to this, Edward and the Spencers fled to their heartlands of support in Wales. However, in Bristol in October, Roger Mortimer and Isabel and their supporters declared that since the king had fled his land, his realm of England, his son should become the head of government and Edward was declared the head of government in his stead. And in November 1326, a search party was sent to Wales to try and find Edward and Hugh the dispenser. And they were found and captured whilst trying to get to Hugh Dispenser's castle in another part of Wales. They were both arrested and Edward was sent to Kenilworth Castle. Hugh de Spencer, on the other hand, was executed for treasonous activities. Upon the capture of Edward, Parliament agreed that Edward should step down and that the young prince should be declared king. Edward was then encouraged to step down. This is an idea that he initially resisted, but then upon being told that if he did not agree to this, his son would not become a king and his dynasty would end. He agreed to save his son. And in January 1327, Edward, his son, was declared King Edward III. In April 1327, 
Edward was moved to Berkeley Castle in Gloucestershire, still a prisoner, and by September 1327, he had passed away. His son, the new king, had been told that his father had died of natural causes. However, it is almost certain that his father had been murdered. There had been three attempts between April and September to free Edward from Berkeley Castle. And he was becoming something of an issue to Roger Mortimer. And it is thought that Roger Mortimer was instrumental behind the orders to murder him. It is thought that Edward was strangled and not that he was murdered by a red hot poker being pushed up his anus. As this would leave visible signs that he'd been murdered as opposed to natural causes as his son had been told. There have also been theories banded about that Edward did not die in September 1327 and that he died later or that he was released in peace to live in Europe away from the crown. But the truth is we'll never really know. The most likely possibility was that he was murdered in Berkeley Castle in September 1327. Now was Edward a good king? The quick answer and the answer in my opinion is no. He was a king that relied upon favourites. He was a tyrant and whilst he did fulfil the first basic duty of kingship, he did not look after his wife who would have been a political tool had he used her correctly. So no, Edward was a bad king. He did not deal with the situation that his father had left him very well. In fact, he allowed Scotland to grow in power, he allowed France to grow in power, and ultimately he got usurped. So that is a clear sign that even contemporaries did not like him. So no, Edward was not a good king. As always, I'm going to recommend a couple of books for you guys. Firstly is Quinn's in Kings and Queens, The Indispensable History of England and Harmonics. This is a really fantastic book, really good sailing guide to everything you need to know about England and harmonics. And secondly is Dan Jones's The Plantagenets, really readable and really informative. So I'd recommend both of these books to you guys if you want to learn more about Edward II. So now some great news, History of Jackson related. The crystallisation of totalitarianism is finally in my hands and it is available to everyone on Amazon and my History of Jackson website, which is www.historyofjackson.co.uk. Um, I've had some really lovely messages about the book uh, and some great pictures from people sending me pictures of them and their copies. Um, I've been really grateful for the all support, so thank you very much, guys. In the meantime, if you want to keep up to date with everything History of Jackson related, all the links to our social medias, our Facebook, Twitter and LinkedIn are in the description below. If you'd like to support us and what we do, there is a buy as a, well, buy me a coffee profile link in the description below. And again, if you want to keep up with everything History of Jackson related, please head to www.historyofjackson.co.uk. Thank you very much for watching, guys. I really appreciate your support. And I look forward to teaching you all about Edward III next week.